Hello, good afternoon, and good morning to our West Coast listeners. Welcome to KFF's web briefing on the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines in long-term care settings. I'm Tricia Newman, a Senior Vice President here at KFF, and I'm Executive Director of our Program on Medicare Policy. We're very honored to have so many of you join us today. Together, we have spent much of the past year watching the virus sweep through nursing homes across the country, claiming the lives of our parents and our grandparents, neighbors and friends, both residents and staff. The purpose of today's briefing is to learn how the vaccine is rolling out in long-term care settings, including what's working well and what's not and why, and what improvements can be made to vaccinate as many people as possible as quickly as possible in warp speed, as they say. And we have just the right panel of speakers, including some with, who have had boots on the ground to help inform us. Since the first outbreak, long-term care facilities have been ground zero in this pandemic, accounting for close to 40% of all COVID-19 deaths. And once again, we are seeing cases and deaths on the rise in long-term care facilities too. This is despite measures put in place to spread to limit the spread of infections. So it's no surprise that the Centers for Disease Control decided to put long-term care facility residents and staff at the top of the priority list for vaccinations, along with healthcare workers. In addition, the federal government created a partnership with national chain pharmacies to expedite the distribution of vaccines to long-term care facilities to get needles into arms quickly. As of yesterday, just over 1 million doses have been given in long-term care settings through this federal partnership. This marks a significant increase in vaccination since the first of the year. I think we can all agree this is really good, good news. But 1 million doses are just about enough to vaccinate less than half of the 2 million people who live either in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. This, <coughs> excuse me, this means that many older adults in long-term care settings are still waiting for their turn to get a vaccine. It also means we have a long way to go in vaccinating the roughly 3 million people who work in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And speaking of workers, 29% of people working in healthcare settings said they probably would, would not or definitely would not get vaccinated, according to a recent poll put out by our KFF Vaccine Monitor Project. Today, we'll learn whether and to what extent vaccine hesitancy is proving to be a serious issue for people who are working in long-term care settings. And I have a spoiler alert, it is. Many people in work, who work in long-term care facilities are genuinely worried about the safety of COVID-19 vaccines, and they are fearful of side effects. The concerns about vaccine safety need to be taken seriously to protect the residents, to protect the staff and their families in the community. So I, for one, am really eager to hear from our speakers. Hopefully there are lessons to be learned from the initial rollout in long-term care settings so that we can all return to some kind of normals, normalcy, whatever that is, safely and relatively soon. Clearly we have a lot to cover in a short period of time. In a moment, I'm going to ask my colleague, Priya Chadabaram, a senior policy analyst at KFF, to kick off the discussion with the latest data and trends that she's been tirelessly tracking since the start of the pandemic. Following Priya's remarks, we'll pass the baton to Rachel Garfield, my colleague at KFF, who's the vice president and co-director of the program on Medicaid and the Uninsured. She'll moderate the panel and coordinate questions for discussion. We'll then turn to our all-star panel who will bring years of experience and a diverse set of lenses to this discussion, each of whom will speak for about five minutes before we start to take your questions. Our panel includes Mark Parkinson, who's the president and CEO of the American Healthcare Association, which represents over 14,000 skilled nursing facilities and assisted living centers nationwide. Previously, he served as the governor of Kansas. Nicole Howard is next. She's executive director of the California-based Ombudsman Services of Contra Costa, Solana, and Alameda counties. And she's a fierce advocate for long-term care residents. Rita Shaw is next. She's the group vice president of pharmacy operations and services at Walgreens. Walgreens is part of the federal pharmacy partnership for long-term care that's facilitating 
on-site vaccinations of residents and staff in more than 75,000 enrolled long-term care facilities. And last but not least, we hear from Matt Yarnell, who is the national chair of SEIU's Nursing Home Council, and represents a, which represents 150,000 SEIU members who work in skilled nursing facilities. He is a former nursing home worker himself and president of SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania. Finally, as we usually do in these things, I have just two housekeeping tips. First, this web briefing will be recorded. The archive recording and the slides will be posted online and everyone who RSVP will receive notification once they are posted. Second, this is listen only format. We really hope you will submit questions for the speakers at any time during the web briefing using the, Q the Zoom Q&A function, which you see on the screen. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Priya. Priya, take it from here. Thanks so much, Tricia. And to everyone that's tuned in right now, thank you so much. This is an incredibly important topic and I'll be giving a quick update on where we are with cases and deaths in long-term care facilities. So as of January 5th, there have been over 130,000 deaths in long-term care facilities. And this accounts for about 38% of all COVID-19 deaths in the country. Uh, that share has changed since the start of the pandemic. Uh, between April and August of last year, we were seeing that share between 46 and 49%. So the share of deaths in long-term care facilities has dipped to closer to 40%, which is where um, it is right now. The thing that has stayed consistent over the course of the pandemic is that long-term care deaths uh, have consistently accounted for a disproportionate share of all COVID-19 deaths in the country. Uh, the latest data shows that cases account for uh, cases in long-term care facilities account for just 6% of all coronavirus cases in the country, but deaths in these facilities account for 38% of all COVID-19 deaths. Uh, and that gets even more pronounced when you look at state level data. On the map here, you can see that the dark blue states and the green state uh, are states where long-term care deaths account for half or more of all deaths in that state due to COVID-19. Next slide. So recently KFF uh, released some analysis looking at trends and patterns in long-term care facilities. And to no one's surprise, those recent surges have impacted long-term care facilities, those recent surges in cases and deaths. Uh, long-term care facilities have reported their highest new cases in long-term care facilities in December of 2020, and they reported their highest new deaths in long-term care facilities uh, back at the start of the pandemic, uh, April 2020 and May 2020. All of this should be considered under the fact that uh, this data does not consider January 2021 data, and all early data indicates that we will be surpassing the highs, the record highs that we hit in 2020, we will in all likelihood hit new peaks in early 2021 in cases and deaths. Um, and just one other thing to point out here, uh, patterns in cases and deaths in long-term care facilities do follow patterns in cases and deaths that we see nationwide. And this sort of does line up with a lot of the research out there connecting community spread to the spread of the virus in long-term care facilities. Next slide. So when we look at the data a little bit deeper at the state level, we do see that most states reported their highest new long-term care cases and deaths in December 2020 itself. And when we look at sort of the geographic patterns within those states that were reporting these record highs at the end of last year, there are pretty clear clusters. Uh, the Midwest, the West Coast, and a few states in the South were among the states that were reporting record high new deaths in long-term care facilities at the end of last year. Next slide. So now that long-term care facility vaccination efforts are underway, what are we watching out for, we at KFF? Uh, so we recently looked at, um, uh, we recently released some analysis evaluating the literature and research that's been done on the factors associated with increased cases and deaths in long-term care facilities. Those factors include things such as the share of residents in facilities that are Black or Hispanic, urban status, for-profit status, things like that. We're going to be very inter interested to see whether those factors are also associated with high or low rates of vaccination within facilities. 
We're also going to be taking a look at how long it's going to take to vaccinate residents and staff in non-nursing home settings, like assisted living facilities and other residential settings. And finally, the question on all of our minds, how exactly will this vaccine impact, have a short-term and long-term impact on cases and deaths in long-term care facilities due to COVID-19? So with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel Garfield to introduce our panel of experts. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Priya, for that uh, excellent but sobering reminder of why we are focusing on this population. We're now going to turn to our panel and the Q&A, and we'll open the discussion by having each panelist give some opening observations about what they're seeing on the ground in terms of what's working well and what ongoing challenges they'll face. And then we're gonna to turn to questions. And as a reminder, you can submit questions for the speakers using the Zoom Q&A function. So let's start the panel discussion with Mark Parkinson, who will offer some thoughts on how vaccination efforts are going from the perspective of the long-term care industry. Mark. Thank you very much, Rachel. And, and uh, let me first of all start out and say thanks to uh, Kaiser Family Foundation for, for hosting this. It's such an outstanding organization and it's an honor to be a part of it. This panel is fantastic. And I also know that we've got hundreds of folks that are watching this that can make a difference on this issue. So this is not a retrospective, like how did this go kind of thing. This is actually happening right now. And many of you are in a position that can expedite this vaccination process. And so I appreciate you taking some time out to hear how it's going so we can talk about what's been working and what hasn't been working. My background is that my wife and I owned and operated long-term care facilities. Uh, I had the good fortune of being asked to come out to DC about a uh, little over 10 years ago to work with the National Association. And you know things were going along, we thought pretty well. Um, and then the worst tragedy in the history of long-term care occurred with the pandemic uh, for roughly the last year. Uh, we and our members have been working 24 seven to try to do everything we can to fight COVID and we've been losing. Um, the data that Priya showed are, you know, it's just sobering. Um, and we thought coming into the fall that maybe we, you know, the vaccine was around the corner and we were gonna be able to put this behind us. But the incredible spread across the country in November and December, um, as the data that Priya showed indicates have accelerated the cases and the deaths in long-term care. Now, as horrible as that is, um, we also have an incredible opportunity. So I'm gonna talk about that opportunity, then I'm gonna talk about what's, what's going right and what's going wrong, and then just make a renewed plea for the opportunity. What in the heck would the opportunity be with all of this tragedy? Well, the opportunity is this, less than 1% of the population lives in long-term care facilities. Think about that, less than 1%. We're talking about between two and three million people. And yet that very small percentage of our population has accounted for, as Priya indicated, almost 40% of the deaths. Just think about that a minute. Two to three million people accounting for 40% of the, of the deaths in the United States. So what is the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is if we can just get our act together and figure out how to get all of these people vaccinated, in a very short period of time, we can cut the COVID death rate dramatically. Dramatically, we can make a huge difference. We don't have to figure out to, for this opportunity how to vaccinate the 300 million plus people in, in the United States, which is gonna be really hard. If we can just figure out how to vaccinate two to three million that we know who they are, we know where they live, we can have an incredible impact on the death rate from COVID. So it's, it's, it's a real tragedy, but it's also, provides us a way to put a lot of this behind us. Okay, so how has it been going? It's going pretty, it's been going pretty well. A, a huge turnaround occurred a little over a month ago when the CDC made the decision that long-term care residents should be in the absolute top tier of priority. Before that, they weren't. And if that had stood, we would have had a real tragedy in our hands, but the CDC made the right decision. And then they made a decision that I disagreed with, but frankly, it's worked out. The decision that they made that I disagreed with was that they then left it up to the states to make the ultimate decisions in terms of the prioritization. And we were concerned that there might be a rogue governor or two that would make the wrong decision and not put long-term care residents at the top priority, but it does not appear that that has occurred. Virtually every governor and every unit of government that is able to make a decision on this has done what we believe is the obvious thing, 
which is to prioritize folks in long-term care. Okay, so then the issue becomes from prioritization to actually getting vaccines in the arms, how have we been doing? And I know there's been an incredible amount of publicity about how bad the overall rollout of the vaccine has been. I think you have to really separate the long-term care program from that because the long-term care program has actually been going pretty well. We issued a challenge to every governor to have the second dose of vaccine in all long-term care residents by the 1st of March. And I think we have a really good chance to beat that goal. Um, virtually every single facility across the country, particularly on the skilled nursing side, has, has either had their first clinic or their first clinic will be held this week, next week, or the week after that. So we believe that essentially every facility will have its first round of vaccine by the end of January, its second round of vaccine um, before the March 1 deadline that we had really set for the governors to establish. And that what some governors have shown is that when they make it a priority, they've actually been able to beat that pretty significantly. For example, in the state of West Virginia, West Virginia will be finished with their second rounds of vaccines probably in the next week or two. Connecticut is not far behind. So we have seen that with respect to this program in particular, it's gone fairly well. Now, there have been some good things about it and that we've learned and some bad things. And let me tell you the good things. And then I'll talk about the bad things. The good things are, number one, we've learned that the side effects are not nearly what were advertised. I think that we may have made a mistake in an attempt to be so transparent early on. And I think we scared the heck out of a lot of people by talking about how bad some of these effects might be. In reality, it hasn't occurred at all. We have a member that has 300 buildings um, and in the first round of vaccinations only had one employee call off from work because of a side effect. So we're talking about a very minimal number of side effects out there. Second piece of good news is that the residents are really embracing the vaccine program. I wish we had really good hard data and maybe the Kaiser Family Foundation can come up with it for us, but it looks like around 90% of the residents are taking the vaccine. We've been able to get the consents of either those that have the capacity to do so or their guardians. And so we're really seeing a very high success rate with respect to residents taking the vaccine. Now the bad news. The bad news is that we're having a real problem with staff. We're having a real challenge with staff. Um, again, we don't have good hard data, but we think that the uptake with the first clinic for staff has only been about around 50%. In some buildings, it's been as low as 20% and other buildings as high as 80%. We think the overall rate is probably in the 45 to 50% range. This does not mean that our staff are dumb or aren't making good decisions or anything like that. It's just that there's been a lot of misinformation out there. There are rampant rumors spreading on social media that, that the vaccine could cause fertility problems, which has caused concerns among many of the young women that work in our facilities. There's the lingering effect of the Tuskegee experiments. And if you don't believe that's real and that has a real effect, this experience has shown that that is still out there. Um, and so we've really got to redouble our efforts to get the uptake of the staff much better. The good news is that we do have a second round and then a third round of clinics in every single one of these buildings. In the buildings that have had their second round, they're starting to see a greater uptake among staff. The staff have seen that there weren't these terrible side effects that that had been talked about. So we think we may be able to get up into the 65 to 70% range when we get into the second clinics. Now, finally, let me just circle back to why this is a great opportunity and why we need to stick with it. There's been a lot of criticism about the overall vaccine program and the amount of doses that are out there and what has been administered and what has not been administered. It would be a massive error if the second round of vaccine was taken away from long-term care facilities to use in the general population. Now, I know that there are many millions, tens of millions of people in the general population that need the vaccine immediately. And we need to get to them as quickly as we can. But it would be a mistake to do that at the expense of the program that, again, can lower the overall death rate by 40% in just a matter of a few more additional weeks. So our plea to policymakers, and many of you have influence with them as well, is stick with this program. It may not be perfect. It may not be going absolutely as we would hope, but it's going pretty darn well. And if we can finish it off, we can save a lot of lives. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, now let's turn to Nicole Howe, who will offer us some perspective on how patients are faring in this vaccine rollout. Nicole? Thank you, Rachel. And I echo Mark's sentiments about what a great opportunity this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation has provided to us. And I like to think of this meeting a little bit like an interdisciplinary team meeting. It's an IDT meeting. It's in the facility world when we realize that, hey team, we're midstream and we kind of have a problem and it's not all bad, but it's not all good right now. And we need to come together with the best minds and find some solutions. So I agree, this is an opportunity to say, uh, we've had some challenges and let's figure out what those are. Now it's important to remember for the long-term care industry, we have been in this now for almost a year. The horrible events of the Life Care Center at Kirkland occurred in February. And I think all of us who work in the industry at that time began holding our breath and we knew what this would look like. And so for those who live in long-term care, it's important to remember that there are two sides of this uh, sort of equation. There's those in skilled nursing facilities. And I would agree the vaccine rollout is going well in the skilled nursing facilities. Those facilities are medical, they have rehab staff, they have nurses and medical directors, and they are uniquely positioned to be able to execute these kind of vaccine clinics along with the partner like CVS or Walgreens. It's the other side of the equation, what you might call the assisted living. Now in California, we like to be fancy. So we call them residential care facilities to the elderly and we have them in big facilities and small facilities. But those are the folks who just need help with a couple activities of daily living, with medication administration, uh, but they still live in congregate settings. And in my community and in my state, uh, those were sort of secondary to skilled nursing facilities, but they actually are two thirds of the population of those folks who live in long-term care in California. And there's many, many, there's about 200,000 residents who live in long-term care in those kinds of settings in California, outside of the 100,000 who live in skilled nursing facilities. And is those residents, and remember they're residents, they're not receiving medical care, they're just like you and I, uh, they really are those who I think are so confused in this process and I think who are really concerned at this point. There, for them, the experience has been a lot of misinformation and a lot of lack of information. And for them and their families, they are at a breaking point. As Mark said, we've been fighting a battle, but now we're fighting a battle and we're exhausted. And we're told that help is just the next mountain range and that the pharmacy partnership has been activated, but yet it's not getting to us fast enough. And so I would say, I think we have seen an increase in vaccinations, but in my area, the reason I'm seeing the increase is because local public health and other health entities have stepped up and have said, you're right, this, these outbreaks that we're having are placing a significant strain on our hospitals. And in order to address that, we are going to prioritize their vaccinations with the dosages that we are getting as counties, meaning that in addition to the pharmacy partnership, our counties are having to take vaccinations off the top and divert them to long-term care. And let me be clear, I think that is the right decision. As Mark said, we want to make sure that those in long-term care are prioritized for a variety of reasons, both for risk, but also for the strain they place in the hospital system if there are outbreaks. However, uh, the, for these families, what it means is there's a, lot, a lack of certainty, a lack of clarity about how they will be treated and what they can expect and when they can expect the vaccine. And so for residents, this is also coupled with the fact that they have been isolated for now a year. So the effects of COVID are far beyond respiratory illness. They go to actually diminishment in capacity and the ability to engage and also um, mental health. And so for residents, we're at a place of, I think, real desperation and a real decision point as to how we treat those who live in long-term care. Um, so in the spirit of the IDT, I would offer that the next solution going forward is for our local health officials. It is for our local healthcare entities to say, we need to make sure that all long-term care residents are have received their first clinic by at least mid-February. And I think that requires that we all come together, that local elected officials leverage relationships to make sure that happen, uh, that they be uh, asking of their local pharmacy partnership of CVS and Walgreens to be working collaboratively with their local area agency on aging, their ombudsman programs and others to not, and figure out what is the schedule to ensure that everyone has received their first dose of the vaccine no later than Valentine's Day. And so that would really be my suggestion moving forward is that it's, it's a collaborative approach. In long-term care, we learned many years ago that you cannot do it as a single entity. And so to move forward, I would ask us to take that partnership mindset and move this to help both residents and staff of long-term care. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Nicole. Um, now let's turn to Rena Shah, who will offer some perspective on efforts by retail pharmacies to administer vaccines through the partnership program. Rena? Thanks so much, Rachel, appreciate it. And thanks to the Kaiser Fa Family Foundation, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the audience. Um, Mark and Nicole did an incredible job of sharing exactly what's going well and where we have opportunities. And um, I'd like to first all, uh, of all uh, say thank you to all of you as you've partnered with Walgreens and many of our leaders across the country so we can help support the, the skilled nursing facility and the assisted living facilities and all the long-term care facilities that we are looking to achieve. Those stats that Priya shared at the beginning are incredibly staggering and um, really reinforced the need for us to focus in on this vulnerable population first in order for us to be able to ensure that we're heading in the right direction. Um, we at Walgreens, myself, as many, we have 240,000 employees right now that are actively working on this and just are humbled to be a part of the solution here. Um, this year has been long, it has been tiresome, and in this specific population, when the CDC and Operation Warp Speed called us and asked if we would be able to participate and support this effort, we said yes, because we knew that this was a public health effort. We could activate our pharmacists, our technicians, to be able to ensure that these patients get their vaccine as quickly as possible. And with the program, with the federal program, it's been a really great partnership across the states as well as across the CDC and Operation Warp Speed so we can do this in a very quick and efficient manner because we know that our goal is to ensure that all of our members, all of our patients are getting their vaccine. Um, I was at a facility just a couple, just last week um, where residents were getting their vaccine and all the residents and the staff members were cheering on each resident that came in because this was a vaccine that not only provided hope to the individual, but it provided safety and a ray of light that this might be, we might be turning a corner. So it's been incredibly important for us and it just made our mission that much more clear that this is what we're here for. Um, however, the, the skilled nursing facility process as well as the entire program is complex. There are, as as, um, as uh, what was mentioned by Priya, as well as Rachel, what you mentioned at the very beginning, there's 75,000 facilities that are out there. 35,000 that have selected Walgreens to be the ones that are providing care, providing vaccinations. Um, I'm really proud to say that um, through uh, yesterday, we were able to administer over 500,000 doses in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we've been able to serve those patients and staff members um, as well. And so really in the partnership with ACA and many others, we've been able to start moving really quickly. We've completed around 6,000 clinics thus far, 6,000. We have in this next week another 6,000. It just keeps on ramping up. And so there's been a lot of um, puts and takes with the program. The states are the ones that activate the program in that state. Um, so for example, I uh, if we talk about California, California, the state activates the skilled nursing facility program as well as then the next phase, which is Part B, the assisted living facility program. And so when we think about exactly how that works is from when the state activates the program, our goal is to ensure that those clinics, those facilities will have their first dose completed within that three to four week period after a state activates. And I'm proud to say that we're on track to be able to meet that deliverable. And with skilled nursing facilities, as we speak right now, as Mark mentioned, by January 25th, pretty much 95% of the skilled nursing facilities will have had their first dose already administered. And then we will be coming on for their second clinic. And with the program, we're actually coming on for a third clinic as well. And the importance of that is because of exactly what we've been hearing. In case someone didn't get their first dose at that first clinic and they got their first dose at the second, we can then come back on the third one to make sure we're completing that um, effort and ensuring that everyone gets their vaccine. So we're really excited to see the progress that's made. We're confident in the teams. We've had pharmacists and team members that haven't taken a vacation through the holidays, through the entire process, just because they knew how important this was. And so you have the entire organization working to ensure that the skilled nursing facilities, as well as assisted living facilities and residential care um, areas get their vaccine as quickly as possible. There are some things that we're working through, you know, as we go ahead and manage through these clinics, of course, um, you know, the efforts have been very um, positive in how we've been 
been able to, to administer vaccine, but there have been some challenges we've been having to overcome. Um, the first is being vaccine hesitancy that we've just, you know, we've spoken about. We initially, when we received the list of facilities, there was an estimated number of residents and staff members that we anticipated getting vaccine. When we do come on site, it is much lower than what we anticipated. Not so much on the resident on the resident side. That is actually just occupancy changes, but it's much more on the staff side. So with the vaccine that we've received thus far, we've realized that the throughput, even though we're getting through the facilities quickly, the throughput may not be as high because of hesitancy. So what our pharmacists have been doing has been playing not only an administration role, but an education role. And it's been really helpful having clinicians in the facilities helping to explain exactly how we can help support that. The second piece of this has been how we've been helping to support not only vaccine hesitancy, but then also the rollout of the program. There are things that we couldn't control. The program started off in the holidays, Christmas, and as well as when we think of the New Year's, we've seen winter storms and a lot of weather pieces. So our teams have been managing through that and making sure that clinics are rescheduled so that in case there were inventory disruptions or in situations we couldn't control, um, like COVID outbreaks, our teams have been managing through that as well. Lastly, when we think about exactly how this has been happening, we've been partnering with all of you as well as the states on being able to reach out to everyone. One of the biggest areas of opportunities we've had is that we've been calling facilities and it might be four times or six times and we aren't able to get a hold of individuals. And that's where the partnership with the states have been incredibly helpful. So we can partner together to get a hold of that facility and get that clinic scheduled as quickly as possible. Even withstanding all of that, it's been incredibly humbling to see what we've been able to accomplish with 6,000 facilities underway um, that we've completed, another 6,000 to go, and we're just continuing to increase that momentum. Our pharmacists, myself, all the entire organization is really excited to be able to play, play a role in this effort, helping to save lives, and then being able to expand our efforts going forward to phase 1B and C as vaccine continues to grow. So thank you all so much. Really appreciate the opportunity and I'll turn it back over to Rachel. Thanks so much, Rena. Let's turn now to Matt Yarnell who will offer some perspective from the vantage point of skilled nursing facility workers with his opening comments. Matt? Great, um, thanks so much and really appreciate being here. Um, I'm a little emotional listening because I think um, I just, I was a former uh, caregiver myself, a CNA um, in a facility in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, many years ago, back in the late 90s. And um, I just wanted to add a number, which is, you know, when you think about the, the 500,000 cases in, in long-term care facilities, um, you know, at the same time, there has been just almost as many um, uh, sickened caregivers um, in that mix. There's, you know, the last number I had was 425,000 caregivers um, got sick themselves from the virus. Um, and just a little bit uh, close to about 1,300 of those folks have lost their lives. Um, so I just think from the workforce perspective, um, I want to uh, sort of bring that lens into the conversation. Um, you know, and I would just say, you know, given the fact that roughly 40% of the COVID deaths nationwide have been in, uh, in facilities um, and nursing homes, uh, and in my state in particular, it's been seven in 10 deaths. Um, you know, I think there are a number of factors as to the hesitancy that we're seeing from the workforce. Um, you know, I would just say that our experience is that the workforce is, um, is really chronically um, you know, um, short on supplies such as masks, gloves, gowns needed to keep them safe. And, and that, you know, has gotten better at times and worse at times, depending on, uh, you know, where the outbreaks are. Um, you know, most um, folks have been denied hazard pay, even though um, they've done some of the most dangerous work or COVID pay. Um, you know, and then I also just in terms of, and, and many people don't even have the ability to have the time off to be able to quarantine um, if they get sick. And so I just want to say, you know, I think there's like, there's real challenges, and I think we have a sort of moral obligation as a country, um, since this is a uh, you know, nationwide fight against a deadly uh, pandemic, um, that we just need to be frank about the way in which this workforce is treated, because um, I think it reflects on our values as a nation. Um, also, uh, just the rollout has been slow, um, and I think it's it's ticking up as the you know as we heard in the beginning of the call. Um, but also, I would say the the uh, the pharmacy partnership that is sort of in charge of the nursing home rollout. 
I think the one thing that's missing is a, a sort of the worker um, focus at the table. Um, and so, you know, I think that the plan was really built to vaccinate the residents. And um, so there's challenges around uh, making, you know, because there's uh, the, the timing of which facilities are going to get hit when um, from the pharmacies, uh, it's really about vaccinating residents and it's harder to, um, you know, reach all of the staff has been our experience. Um, and then also just the, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation, as we heard from Mark on the front end um, out there. And so there's real hesitancy. And, and we know that, um, you know, uh, that the sort of direct care workforce has, uh, you know, a, a bit of a higher hesitancy based on, um, you know, uh, KFF's um, own research that at about 29% of uh, caregivers or, or folks in this workforce are hesitant, which is higher than the general population. Um, and we think that that's not by accident. I think part of it is they've been in this for a year. Um, if folks are carrying through a really challenging crisis um, and are, you know, sort of at a, at a breaking point, and we need to understand that and invest in this um, workforce. Also, we know that in communities of color, um, you know, uh, black and brown communities in particular, um, which are really disproportionately represented in long-term care work, um, those are, are the workforce, um, that there's very real hesitancy. And I don't think there's been enough attention um, given to the fact of getting trusted voices um, and, and spending the time to really um, help folks understand, um, you know, and, and create forums for those, uh, those um, caregivers directly in those communities to talk to people that they trust. Um, to you know, get their questions answered directly, um, you know, to be able to drive up uh, the rate of vaccination. We think that's really important. Um, and even in our own research in our, our own local union here in Pennsylvania, we had about 35% of our folks um, being hesitant and wanting more information um, you know, before they would take the vaccination. Uh, the last thing I will say, just uh, I have a few other comments, but um, in terms also in long-term care, I just want to flag that home care workers um, were, were largely written out of this, um, who also uh, care for um, a really vulnerable population. And we think that's um, key to the long-term care system as well, uh, you know, making sure that home care um, folks are part, of the, uh, are part of the rollout and making sure there's access for folks to be able to get vaccinated. Um, two examples, um, you know, uh, really one from a worker directly. We have a, a caregiver, Connie, um, who works up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, she's a member of our union. She's a per diem, so she works uh, she doesn't have a regular schedule, but she works often uh, to fill in. And she she never got informed by her employer of when the vaccination um, rollout was happening in her building, so she missed it. Um, and the employer said, well, if you were on the schedule, you would have gotten it. And so we had to do some advocacy work there to get her vaccinated. Um, so, so she was able to then do it. But I think it's just, a again, the program was designed to vaccinate residents, not necessarily giving enough lead time to do, uh, you know, sort of joint education with um, caregivers to try to drive up the uh, caregivers taking the vaccination themselves. And then also on home care, we've done a lot of work to make sure they're written in on the front end. Um, and here at, in Pennsylvania, we worked with our DOH to hold back 10% um, you know, of the vaccine to be used for uh, disaffiliated or unaffiliated caregivers. Um, but even with that work we've done, a lot of the folks who have the vaccines are saying they don't have the doses available to those, those kinds of workers, the um, uh, home care workers uh, in particular. I would say some solutions that we think um, that could help us um, get better as we move forward. Um, one is figuring out how labor has a, a, much, uh, a much more sort of integrated uh, message here. We believe we are a trusted messenger um, you know, uh, in the workforce, um, and we have relationships and networks that could help uh, move in the communities um, across our country. Um, and then also we think, uh, you know, just our primary focus has been on education outreach um, and really sort of breaching the sort of hesitancy, um, you know, through countering the false information. So we as SEIU have at our executive board adopted uh, vaccine principles, which encourage vaccination, address issues of equity and transparency and demand universal access. Um, we've held webinars. We're going to continue to do that in multiple languages with our members um, so they can ask questions directly to uh, medical experts um, who reflect their communities. We've conducted extensive social media uh, um, communications and campaigns around vaccinations and um, also put out uh, many fact sheets. So we're trying to you know, sort of help um, you know, bring um, some more trusted voices to, to the workforce. And then I would just say in terms of other solutions, um, we think that employers and big corporations should not use the vaccine as a substitute for worker safety. Um, you know, we think that the, you know, the challenges on the front end and, and even still today with PPE, access to PPE, access to paid time off, access to, you know, frankly, healthcare that's affordable, 
Um, and knowing that if I care for folks and I get to a place where I'm sick and I need a ventilator, I'm going to have one are all issues that we need to address in the long term care system um, going forward. And so um, maybe I'll stop there, but we, we feel like there's a lot of work to be done to make this program work better. Um, and we are totally for, um, you know, uh, leading and, and championing, get, you know, um, helping the workforce get their vaccinations. Um, but we feel like there's some very critical steps that have to happen to, to build trust um, from a workforce who's feeling very distrustful um, of their government, um, of their employers. Um, you know, they've been through uh, something that no one could ever explain. I was a caregiver myself. I was used to um, doing, uh, you know, postmortem care, but I was used to doing that maybe once a month. Um, maybe once every three months, um, you know, we've had members share their stories of having an entire unit, you know, that 12, 15 people pass away on a shift. Um, that's a kind of an impact that you can't imagine unless you're in that moment. Um, and so I just, uh, you know, deeply appreciate the workforce and all they've been through and urge us all to work together to try to figure out how do we get in front of um, this deadly uh, pandemic. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you to all of our panelists for setting the stage for our discussion to follow. Uh, we're now gonna turn to the questions that were submitted via the Q&A function. And there is still time to send in questions if you have any. Um, I do wanna mention that we have several other KFF experts on hand to be available during this Q&A component of the event. Uh, Jen Cates, who is Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy, who has been following the pandemic overall and closely tracking vaccine rollout. Samantha Artiga, who is Vice President and Director of the Racial Equity and Health Policy Program, who has been monitoring the pandemic's effect on communities of color. And Mary Beth Musumichi, who is an Associate Director with the Program on Medicaid and the Uninsured, who has been tracking the pandemic's effects on seniors and people with disabilities, uh, particularly those who require home and community-based services. So I wanna uh, kick off the Q&A with a question that we um, have had from multiple people. And that is, um, we've heard some news about facilities considering making vaccines mandatory for staff. And so I'm hoping you can share your perspective on these policies and also talk about how they might compare to policies related to other, uh, other vaccines, particularly influenza. So let's start with Matt for that one and then go to Mark and any of the other panelists are welcome to chime in as well. Yeah, I, I'll just be brief. I, we think it's a mistake to, to mandate um, the vaccine, just given where we are as a country, given what we watched unfold at our capital steps um, you know, a week ago, um, given what this workforce has been through. We think that will actually be counterproductive in this moment. We really do think it is take a step back um, and, and do the, I think, the, the hard work and the communication work um, to, to really uh, sort of meet people where they are uh, and, and strongly encourage um, you know, through working together to get um, you know, to 75% um, vaccinated. Uh, we really think that it will be, uh, from a public health perspective, bad to, to move to mandation. Thanks. Mark, do you want to um, give your perspective sure. on that? Yeah, this is, a, this is an important question. And let me just, first of all, thank Matt for all of his comments. He, he's right. And, you know, I, I really neglected to point out a, a sobering stat that isn't talked about often enough, which is that over a thousand frontline long-term care workers have died, many, many of them quite young. Uh, and it's just the, the sacrifices and the her heroism that they've showed has been inspiring. And they are underpaid and they don't have the benefits that they need. And it's, it's you're, you're right, Matt, when this is, we get this behind us, we've really got to decide as a country where our priorities are. Um, there are many providers that are thinking about this topic today. Should, should, they, should they mandate the vaccine? Um, our, our best understanding is that a, an employer does have the right to do that. Uh, we don't think the government does because apparently there's law that says that when a vaccine's approved under an emergency use authorization, it, because it's an emergency, the government can't, can't do it. Uh, I'm not sure if that's solid or if that's a widely accepted view, but that's, that's the discussion point. But the discussion point also appears to be that employers can do it if they want to. I will tell you that very few have. Um, and very few have because of the, the points that Matt has made. The other problem is we have a chronic problem of not being able to find enough workers for our buildings. You know, I know there's a lot of people that want to mandate staffing requirements, and I certainly understand that. But the reality of the real world is it's hard to find people to work in these buildings. And so there's a fear among providers that they, they'd like, many would like to mandate the vaccine. But there's a fear that if they do, they'll, they can't afford to lose a single CNA. 
um, because of the shortage. And there's fear that there will be a, a lot of people that will be lost. I will tell you that there is, a, there is an operator of about 50 buildings who has confidentially, because he just, they, just don't want, they just don't want to become a big news story or a big discussion point, they have mandated it. Um, they are requiring their, their workers to take the vaccine. And in the first clinic, 75% of them did. Um, it will be, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the second clinic. Um, so it, it, I'm agnostic on this. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I know that we have to get the acceptance rate among staff much higher than it's been. We got to figure out a way to do it, get it at 65 or 70%. And I'm way more a carrot than a stick person. I've been encouraging providers to offer incentives and rewards and bonuses to people that get the vaccine as opposed to punishments if they don't. But one way or another, we've got to get this rate much higher than it is right now. Thanks so much. Um, the next question we have is about um, rolling out the vaccinations to other settings, specifically assisted living um, facilities. And so I'm wondering if the panelists can talk um, from both the perspective of the partnership as well as other perspectives about that phase of the rollout, exactly what needs to happen to make that successful. And then I'm also interested in perspectives on additional rollout to people who are in other types of settings such as group homes um, uh, or receiving home care. So let's start with uh, Rena talking about the partnership plans and how they may be shifting those to reach this, um, this other community. Sure, definitely. Um, so, so ultimately, uh, as it relates to the assisted living facility group, that bucket is definitely much bigger because we've lumped in all of the CC, CCRCs, the residential homes, there's all of these other homes that are in there. When you talk about the adult living facilities or the assisted living facilities, it's very similar to what we've done with the skilled nursing. Um, we've, we've reached out to all of the facilities, scheduled clinic dates for clinic one, two, and three, so that we can get them uh, immunized as quickly as possible. Um, there are some barriers we're facing. Uh, some of these facilities have, uh, you know, have minimal technology tools, um, need to register their individuals, need to be able to complete some of the, the administrative pieces that are required by the CDC so that we can make sure we're reporting all of this information appropriately. And so those are barriers that we're working through as we speak right now, because if they're not a part of a large organization, sometimes it's the, the coordinator that's on site having to do a lot of those pieces. And so there's a little bit more handholding that our teams are having to do just to ensure that those T's are crossed and those I's are dotted. Um, but as it relates to how it's being rolled out, each state has activated that part of the program program at different times. Some states have activated at the same time. And so in those in those states, we're able to move pretty quickly and we're, we're already immunizing in those facilities. Um, in those states that have waited because they wanted to go with the most vulnerable first, um, those states that have activated were three to four weeks from there. That's when we expect to complete those, um, those clinics. But uh, the teams are, you know, continuing to, to forge forward and ensure that we're supporting that. And um, as, you know, Know, I think Mark said it every single day we uncover a new item that we're just having to be agile on and to continue to help support. And so with the assisted living facility group, since that's relatively starting now, I'm sure we'll have more feedback in the next week or two weeks so that we can bring it back to this audience or being, bring it back to our partners to, to ensure that everyone's on the same page of what's going well, but then what are the other areas that we need to continue to tackle? Thanks so much, Rena. Nicole, I know you mentioned um, the rollout to um, assisted living in other settings as well. And I'm wondering if you could comment on what specifically you think needs to be done to make that operate a little bit more smoothly or to make sure it does go smoothly, at least um, in your experience in California. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. So within Operation Warp Speed, I think that the pharmacy partnership is but one weapon. And I think that we need to start seeing it as one way for the vaccine to enter long-term care facilities, but particularly for those, as Rena said, who are not as technologically savvy, who don't have the system set up, we need additional support. And I want to give an example of what we have done in Contra Costa County. Choice in Aging, a local aging nonprofit that is an adult day, adult day health, MSSP, they are working with what we call six beds, which are like assisted living in a house. And they are contacting them, doing all of the administrative work in prep mod, and then county public health, along with the nurses from the adult day health program, are coming to administer the vaccine. They started yesterday, they vaccinated 30 residents. 
And that is amazing. And I think that's the kind of partnerships we need to see that particularly in California, if we only rely on the pharmacy partnership, we will not uh, be able to make significant progress in the time necessary. So it needs to be both, you know, let's look at what partnerships are available. Is it local adult day pro programs? Is it, um, farm is it other additional pharmacies? I think the long-term care pharmacies really need to be brought into this process. They typically work with assisted livings very well, but they've really been cut out of this process. And I think we need to bring them back in and we need to set a really firm and clear your goal of we need to have everyone having at least the first uh, dose by February 14th. And if that is not the case, why not? the Why can't that happen? And if not, let's, what do we need to be put in place? It needs to be very clear. Uh, I appreciate, I think Reen and her team are moving with all deliberate speed for what they can do, but the problem is bigger than what one organization can take on. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, we have a few questions that are focused on kind of some of the logistics of rollout, particularly given that um, both the staff and residents within a particular facility may shift over time. Um, and so I'm wondering if folks can talk a little bit about whether they're seeing that as a major challenge. Um, Matt mentioned that in the example he gave uh, in Pennsylvania and what is being set up to address those aside from you know this individual advocacy that that he discussed are there other provisions being made uh, for the fact that both staff and residents may move in and out of facilities over time um i'll keep that one to i get back to rena for the logistics and then we can move on to the other panelists yeah definitely i think the the first piece is is that we set the the three clinic dates in advance for the facility. And so as Matt mentioned, if the first clinic date, there wasn't enough information that you need to join on that date, the intent is that the facility coordinator would be able to share the upcoming three clinic, the upcoming two after that with all of the team members that are at that facility because it's, the, it's just as important for us because we have enough vaccine after confirming with the facility, we will have enough vaccine for the staff and the residents and um, the staff are equally as important as the residents because they're the ones making sure that everyone is staying safe, that there's continuity of care. And so those three clinic dates from a logistical standpoint helps tremendously so that everyone can plan around that. That's why that second clinic date, we're seeing a little bit more uptake as Mark mentioned of the staff because they have a little bit more time um, since the first one was during the holidays. It was during times when they couldn't happen. Um, the second piece that we would say logistically is the, you know, the plan is to ensure that those staff members, in case they can't come in, we are looking at, is there ways that we can, after the program ends, can we offer a voucher or other program where those staff members can come into a Walgreens and be able to get their vaccination, their second dose, or be able to be that safety net in case they weren't there on that clinic day. So those are tools that we're working on so that it's it's not just honed in on that one location or that one time frame that we're giving options to ensure that everyone's getting immunized. Great. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have any comments from the facility perspective on some of those challenges. Yeah, the, the, first of all, the questions are, are really good um, because, you know, I, I, like, like Matt, I've also worked in, in buildings for 10 years and the, the staffs, we, we staff 24 hours a day. So, so in a typical building, there are, there are three shifts. And it's particularly tough to get folks that work the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift in, in a lot of these circumstances. I think one of the things about the program that's really good is that there are three clinics. Um, the, 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 the architecture of the program is that Walgreens or CVS or the long-term care pharmacy, whoever has been selected, comes out to the building on three different occasions, not just once, not just twice, but then that extra time to hopefully pick up situations that haven't been able to be managed in other, in other settings. And then my understanding is, and others on the panel may know more about this, that the, the frontline workers, all of the workers are of course also healthcare workers, which would make them eligible to also be vaccinated in most states, along with all of the other healthcare workers in the settings, which typically are hospitals where those clinics are taking place. So it is definitely a real issue because of the 24 seven nature of long-term care, but it, it is a solvable one. Um, I, I see a lot of questions about the uptake among residents, which is, a, or I'm sorry, among staff, which is a much harder uh, problem to solve. I've seen a lot of questions about whether or not, you know, there are best practices and there definitely are. There are facilities that have been very proactive about this that are educating 
um, that have a much higher percentage of staff uptake. And a, a principal issue seems to be, do you have the leadership of the staff? Do you have the DONs? Do you have the administrators? And then sometimes it's respected frontline workers. Do you have them along saying, hey, this is a good thing. No, those rumors aren't accurate. Um, and those are the kind of people we really need to cultivate and encourage. Great, I wonder, um, Matt, if you wanna pick up on that and talk both about the initial question and then um, also what Mark mentioned about what are the effective strategies for, for overcoming some of, um, some of the staff concerns? Yeah, a, a couple things real quick. I think um, just from experience, we we ran into given the uh, the way in which doses were distributed, we ran into some facilities on the first stop that only residents were given the vaccination, and some the staff were told you're going to wait till the second stop. Um, and and we were we were concerned about that because of the the nature of staff coming in and out of the buildings. Um, that felt concerning. And so um, I think just continuing to figure out how do we get to everyone um, feels important. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say in terms of the vouchers idea and the, you know, being able to go to the pharmacy, um, I think we need to you know, be working closely um, with uh, you know, labor unions, employers, states, um, and, and the, you know, the two pharmacies leading this program from the national level because there are huge deserts um, out there and particularly in communities of cover, color that do not have access to a pharmacy or don't have the resources to get there. Um, and so we should be thinking about that um, you know, as we're moving forward to, you know, if we don't get them at the facility, how do we make sure, and this is really imp important for home care workers is how do we get more sites for people to be able to go to um, and make sure they're accessible to communities that um, are under-resourced and don't have access to the, the particular pharmacies leading the program. Um, so I think that's important to, to flag. And then I think um, particularly with the workforce, I, I really do think it's um, figuring out how to in particular regions. And again, I think partnering with labor, employers, um, state and local governments, um, you know, and, and community groups, um, you know, is how do we get sort of clergy, doctors, community leaders um, uh, to, to help um, you know, create um, ways and forums in which workers, uh, you know, caregivers can, you know, get their answers uh, to their questions directly um, from human beings to try to debunk the, um, you know, the, you know, the sort of fear and hesitancy that's out there um, for lots of really good reasons. Um, it just feels like that is important as we think about moving forward as well. Great, thank you. I think we have time to squeeze in one more question before we uh, reach our time. And so I wanna open this uh, one up to all of the panelists who have been um, paying attention to what's going on. And we have several questions that are asking um, whether specific factors are associated with m more success in particular facilities. I know Mark talked about some of the factors that may be associated with higher staff take up, but um, specifically wondering, is it rural location and logistical problems? Uh, we had a couple questions about union uh, union staff and things like that. So I'm wondering if you could say, aside from, or, or maybe it's just echoing Mark's comments, um, uh, why have some uh, facilities had higher rates than others uh, in this first wave of rollout? Um, do you want to start with uh, Nicole, that one? So I think that my data is much more sort of like divining rod that I don't have any actual firm data on that. What I will say is we have sort of heard that there is a higher uptake in assisted living facilities for staff at, than from skilled nursing facility staff. And I wonder if partly there's an issue here around like the sort of level of exhaustion that it's hard to ask people to make a good solid decision when they are so exhausted and they are so tired and so overworked and underpaid that that's a really challenging thing to ask. I also would say that within the assisted living community, some of those employers have been a little more creative in their compensation, in their morale building. And so I think uh, facilities are more to place to offer opportunities for staff to ask questions in a non-judgmental environment. That is really anecdotal, but that again is what we're seeing is that in assisted living facility staff are more likely to take the vaccine, whereas in skilled nursing, there does tend to be some additional skepticism. Okay. Um, any other panelists wanna weigh in on that? I would just say it depends. I, I agree, and I just think it, it depends on the facility. And it depends on um, these places are really challenged. I mean, I think we, if 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 you pulled the staff vacancies um, from skilled nursing facilities right now, it would tell a very um, uh, sobering uh, tale of the the impact that this year's worth of COVID has had on this industry. And I just think that um, you know. It, we, we need to get our arms around it. <laughs> uh, I think that's some of it. Um, and some facilities have more resource, so they've been able to do a little better. But, uh, but I think if you, if you looked nationally at the vacancy rate right now, um, I think we would find a sobering, uh, I, would, I would say an alarming 
um, you know, trend in terms of uh, the workforce, um, you know, walking away here. And it's, and that's the last thing we need to have happen. People, people need to have um, caregivers and uh, that's gonna be really important going forward. Thanks so much. Well, we are nearing the end of the hour. So unfortunately um, uh, we need to wrap up and we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, and I think been able to really highlight um, a range of really important issues. Uh, you know, what I heard is we've done relatively well um, in reaching out to nursing facility residents, but there's still a lot of ground to cover, particularly with staff. Um, and then there's the ongoing challenge of reaching the rest of the long-term care community, including both staff um, and residents in other types of facilities or those receiving uh, services at home. And I think we've heard some, some great discussion about where this public-private partnership can work well, um, perhaps uh, learning some lessons for rolling that out to the general population and where maybe some other strategies may be needed for particular groups. And then lastly, I think we just started to really scratch the surface on issues in equity and the need to understand at a more granular level where additional effort may be needed, particularly in taking hesitancy seriously to understand why people are declining vaccines or why rates are lagging in certain areas or for some, for some groups. Um, KFF is going to continue to work in this space. We have additional resources available on our website, kff.org, including the two reports released today on trends in cases and deaths and what's known about outbreaks. Um, we will also continue our work through our vaccine monitor program to conduct polls and focus groups to dive deep into the public's views about vaccines and their experience for getting it. I want to remind you that the web briefing today will be recorded and posted online later today at kff.org uh, if you'd like to share the link with others. And so I'd like to wrap up by once again thanking our panelists and our presenters um, for sharing their time and insight and um, uh, on this very, very important issue. And thank you to all of the attendees for, for your attendance today. <laughs>